Hello, my name is Kyra Kramer and I am author of Edward the Six in a Nutshell by May Global Publishing. And I'm going to tell you a little bit today about my book. Now, the book is obviously written about Edward the Sixth. He was the son of a very famous Tudor king, Henry the Eighth. Now, very famously, Henry the Eighth tried and tried to get a legitimate male heir. And finally, his third wife, Jane Seymour, was able to provide this for him. Sadly, Jane lost her life not long after, but Henry had what he'd wanted for 30 years of his reign. He finally had the little boy. Now, this made Henry justifiably proud. It made Henry feel as though he was a true king. His line would continue. He put all of his hopes and all of his love and all of his pride in his son. Now, Edward would turn out to be the last reigning Tudor king. He would be followed by his sisters Elizabeth and Mary, but the next king of England would be James I, who was actually the House of Stuart. He was descended from the Tudors on the female line. Now, Edward was a very, very cute little boy and very healthy and chubby and sweet, and Henry protected him in a way that is really, really hard for the modern mind to understand. Uh, Henry was sort of like the precursor to all helicopter parents, and he was also justifiably proud of Edward VI. Edward was a prodigy. He astounded his tutors with how much he could learn. He fluently spoke French, Spanish, and Italian, and he was so good at Latin that when he met the French ambassador in 1548, when he was still just a little kid, they conversed in Latin because the Edward was more fluent in Latin than he was even in French. Uh, the little king was also adept at reading and writing in Greek. He studied Aristotle and other ancient philosophers in their original language. And he was basically as much of a polymath as his father. He also was schooled and excelled at geometry, astronomy, music, writing, archery, religion, geography, cartography, warfare, and even economics. In fact, he was better than his father at economics and other things. Now, Henry VIII died on the 28th of January in 1547, and Edward VI was crowned king on the 20th of February that year. Edward reigned for just five years, but a lot happened in those five years, and he made a bigger mark than he's generally given credit for. However, for those first couple of years, he was still just a little guy, and the real King of England was his uncle, Edward Seymour. Now, Edward Seymour... <laughs> What he did was he pulled some shenanigans with Henry VIII's will. He started passing out presents to himself and others. He made himself the Duke of Somerset. He gave a lot of titles and money and positions to other members of the private the Privy Council. And as a result, he was able to convince them to let him convince Edward VI to make him the Lord Protector of the Realm. So he was the de facto King of England, as well as the Duke of Somerset. Although Somerset turned out not to be a very good king, he was really, really good at founding a dynasty. The Duke of Somerset is still in existence today. There's the 19th Duke of Somerset directly descended from Edward Seymour. This guy's name is John Michael Edward Seymour, and his 34-year-old Sebastian will one day be the 20th Duke of Somerset. So, although the first Duke of Somerset was very good at being a duke, he was very, you know, very bad at pretending to be king. He messed up a lot. The first thing he did was he waffled in terms of militarily by allowing the French to abscond with at the then five-year-old Mary, Queen of Scots, and now she would get to marry the Dauphin of France instead of Edward VI, which was the English goal. So he messed that up. And then he managed to upset the majority of the country because he decided to take away all the trappings of popery from churches. So no more ash on Ash Wednesdays or Palm on Palm Sundays or candles on Candlemas. And by taking the comforts of their religion away from an already economically stressed populace, he got two rebellions. He got the Prayer Book Rebellion in Devon and Cornwall, and he got the Kent's Rebellion in Norfolk. 
Somerset had mercenaries come in to quell the rebellions, but sadly, um, there's nothing quite like foreign mercenaries killing the populace to make them in general unhappy. Part of the reason he was so dead set against Catholics at this time is because the alternative to Edward VI's reign would be Mary I, who would eventually be Mary I, uh, and Mary was an ardent Catholic. So if the Catholics overthrew Edward VI and put Mary in their place, not only would Somerset lose his nice cushy position as fake king, he would probably lose his head. So he decided to tyrannize the Catholics. That was not a really good thing to do. Now, the worse he did at being fake king, uh, the more tense he became about any kind of threat to his authority. He eventually killed his own brother, Thomas Seymour. Now, one could argue this wasn't much of a loss because Thomas Seymour did nothing but try to seduce the 13-year-old you know, Elizabeth I at the time. Um, when she was living with him and Henry VIII's widow, Catherine Parr. But still, Somerset beheaded his own brother to hold on to power. Thomas wanted someone else, namely him, to be in charge of the king's person. He didn't think it was fair that Somerset got to be de facto king and had total control over Edward. And uh, from this dispute, Thomas lost his head. Brotherly love only goes so far. Now, after two and a half years of watching Somerset mess up severely, the Privy Council decided that he shouldn't be the protectorate anymore. When Somerset heard the news, he reacted very calmly. Not. He grabbed Edward VI on the 7th of November in 1549, and he ran away with the kidnapped king to Windsor. He also told the little boy that the count, Privy Council wanted to kill both of them and that he was just doing it to save Edward's life. Now, of course, this scared Edward to bits and poor little Edward was convinced that the Privy Council was coming to kill him and his beloved uncle and oh goodness, what would happen? Uh, the council nonetheless came to rescue the young king, but it took him quite a while to convince him that they weren't there to murder him and steal his throne. However, eventually they calmed him down, explained that nope, nope, they just wanted to take him back and they were going to have the Privy Council was going to be the Regent Council as opposed to having just one protectorate. And Edward felt better and he made them promise not to hurt his uncle and everything went smoothly and he rode in triumph back to London shortly after his 12th birthday. Now the king had a council to advise him um, but no one person to be regent over him. What Edward, even though he was just 12, learned from this is that he couldn't trust anybody. He may have just been a little kid, but he was a genius, and he was very, very much like his grandfather, Henry VII, in personality. So although Edward would listen to his counselors and his tutors, especially Archbishop Thomas Cramner, he quickly decided that his would be the final say on any matter. So even though he was just 12, Edward had become king. Now, Edward's favorite and most trusted counselor was John Dudley, the Earl of Warwick, and eventually the first Duke of Northumberland. Later, it would be said that the king was Northumberland's puppet, that Northumberland wanted to rule in the king's place, like Edward Seymour had, and that Northumberland wanted Queen Jane Grey to be named heir because she was married to his son and therefore he could rule the kingdom through them. Well, as you'll read in my book, this is all poppycock. Edward VI was not a puppet king. He was, according to Northumberland, he was as much of an age as if he were 40. And he ruled, not anyone else. Now, sadly, Edward VI died on the 6th of July, 1553. He was just a little bit short of 16 years old. He was engaged to a French princess. He was doing a good job running the country and he was actually pulling the economy back up out of the, well, I guess at that time, the cesspit since they didn't have flush toilets. But he was really working hard and then all of a sudden, a previously healthy young king died. He died of a respiratory ailment, but no one's quite sure what it is. A lot of people just assume that it was tuberculosis, but 
No, it didn't quite act like tuberculosis. It was the strangest form of tuberculosis ever. Well, in my book, I have a theory that what killed him is actually what also killed his uncle, Arthur Tudor, and his half-brother, Henry Fitzroy. In my book, I detail the theory that they all died of a genetic condition that Western medicine has only recently become familiar with. I will let you read the book to find out more about it, and then you can tell me what you think of the theory. So this has been a short presentation on Edward VI in a nutshell. I hope you read it, I hope you enjoy it, and I hope you let me know what you think of my theory. All right, have a great day.